I can wait. My whole life has been about waiting. <clears throat> First, I waited for a husband, and then God blessed me with Zechariah. Then we waited for children. We waited and waited and waited, but a child never came, and soon wondering when became wondering if. A child will come in time, Zechariah would say to me. My mother, however, would say that being childless meant God was displeased with me. But why was he displeased with me? Why was he not blessing us? Zechariah was a priest, as was my father, and his father before him. We obeyed every law. Why weren't we being blessed? Every birth in my village, I felt that disgrace. I didn't understand why, but now I know that I was wrong, that I was in God's favor, and that he had plans for me that were beyond my wildest dreams. You see, one day Zechariah came home, and he said, um, not in words, because he was so excited, um, and I was a little fearful that something had happened at the temple, but he was so excited that he grabbed a pen and a piece of parchment, and he wrote down one word, angel. Angel, through weird gestures, I figured out that he, in the holy of holies, an angel came to him and told him that I would have a child, a son named John, who would bless the people and who would make men who were prepared for the Lord. So here I am, just about to show, and I think I can wait. Waiting, it appears and seems that so many of us are always waiting. I have to confess that, that I've been waiting for a long time. I've been waiting for one of those moments in ministry where I could, I could stand up and I could say, I have the answers. I can explain why things happen. We had a series of sermons weeks ago where we explored the question why. Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does evil exist if we worship an all-loving God? How can these things happen? This week changed so many of us. And what's sad is this week has become all too common, where we wake up one day and we hear the news reports of some additional tragedy. And so we wait. I have to confess that on Friday I scrapped my sermon. We're in the middle of a sermon series where we're looking at the journey. Today's focus is on Elizabeth. I was going to show you some wonderful video footage from the Holy Land and talk about the role of mentors and spiritual mentors in our lives because that's what I believe Elizabeth was for Mary, was a spiritual mentor. And that's important. But what happened on Friday really trumps the importance of simply talking about mentors, what I think we have to do today is we have to acknowledge where we are spiritually. I have a group of friends that I correspond with through a preacher's network on Facebook. It's a United Methodist Preacher's Network, and they all kind of post their thoughts. And one of the pastors on Friday in kind of the mid to late afternoon posted a question to other clergy on the network, said, are you going to scrap your sermons for Sunday? Are you going to prepare a new sermon? What are you going to do? And so as we began to work through that and talk through that, one of the things that pastors began to converse back and forth is many said, well, uh, we're going to change the liturgy for the lighting of the candles. We're going to do something with the prayer. We're going to do something with the anthem. Some said, we're going to redo our sermons. I started thinking about it. Here it is today, and we're lighting the candle of joy. I mean, how, how do you light the candle of joy on a day like today? Some of my colleagues said, well, you, you have to light the candle of joy because we need, as a people of faith and a people of hope, we have to have some semblance of joy in the one who comes to save us from the darkness. Darkness can't be the final word. And I agree. Friends, we light the candle of joy today because we need joy in our lives. 
I have to confess to you, though, that as a father, this one sticks in my craw. As a person, as a pastor, this one sticks in my craw. You know, we, we want to say that things have changed for the worse. And in many ways, things have changed for the worse. But in other ways, things haven't really changed either, have they? They haven't changed. I mean, all you have to do is go back to Matthew's account of the birth narrative and go to the second chapter. I don't know if you're aware of this. I mentioned it last week in passing. But go to the second chapter and you read of King Herod and the massacre of the infants. Things haven't changed. There are still people who would seek to bring evil to our doorsteps. There are still people that will do horrific things, atro commit atrocities. And the reality is it's easy for us to point and to say, those people, but friends, evil resides in the heart of every human being. But thankfully, thanks be to God, evil and darkness isn't the last word. Harper Grace, in her baptism, is a reminder that God's grace is already working in our lives before we ever knew it. I'm thankful for Justin and Kara, parents who care enough about their child that they would raise that child in a Christian home. I'm thankful for a church that has a choice to be proactive in the ways in which we reach out to children and students in our community. I'm thankful for all of those things, but more than anything, I'm thankful for the one that John speaks of. I mentioned to you all that only Matthew and Luke tell us the story of the birth narratives. And that's true. But the gospel writer John talks about the importance theologically of the birth of Christ. And all you have to do is turn to the first chapter of the gospel of John. And John says this. He says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. And I love this, my favorite part. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. I want to say that again. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Friends, we have to light this candle today. Because we need to be reminded that death is not, hear me, death is not the final word. But this one sticks in my craw. This one bothers me. And you might ask, why didn't the others bother me? They've all bothered me, but this one really bothers me. And maybe it bothers me because that's how old my kids are. Maybe this one bothers me because on Thursday, on Thursday, I was talking to one of my mentors, a pastor by the name of Jim Downey. He works in Sedalia, Missouri. He's one of my dearest friends and mentors in ministry. I call Pastor Jim more often than I call my own mother. I call Jim twice a week. I call my mother on average once every 10 days. She keeps score. I called Jim, and on Thursday, friends, this Thursday, it's amazing when you look back how eerie conversations are. When you look back and you see these conversations. In Sedalia, Missouri, they've arrested four high schoolers, okay, who had planned next week to cause mayhem and destruction in the high school. Do you know why? They're, from their perspective... Next week, you know what next week is, don't you? Been watching television lately? The Mayans are on the clock. It's the end of the world. And these high schoolers thought that they could cause mayhem and destruction and chaos in their school because it's the end of the world. 
and thankfully, somebody got wind of this. They arrested them, all right? I don't know what they're doing with them. But what Jim called me about on Thursday, he says, hey, man, I need your prayers. We've got a lot of parents that have been calling the church and asking what they should do. Some of the parents have decided they're not bringing their kids to school next week because they're afraid that somebody's going to do something crazy on the 19th or the 20th or the 21st. And he said, has there been anything happened down in your area? And I said, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I said, everybody's, nobody's really talking about it that much. I said, but um, yeah, I, I know it's coming. Then Friday, he called. And he says, hey, you remember what we talked about yesterday? I said, man, how could I forget? He said, man, that seems to pale in comparison now. He said, Corey, I've got legitimate fear in our community that I'm dealing with right now. He said, when you add what happened here in Sedalia this week and you add now what's happened uh, yesterday in Connecticut, he said, I I've literally got emails just flying all. People are re-looking at our security at the church. Uh, they're asking all kinds of questions. He said, what do I do? Here's my mentor asking me, what do I do? And I said, Jim, I don't know what all you do but I know one thing you have to do. you got to talk about it on Sunday. And you got to remind people. You have to remind people that although we live in a world where we can't guarantee. You know, I, let me get back to why it sticks in my craw. I'm not ready to move on yet. It's still in my craw. I, I thought I'd get it out of my system preaching it twice. It's just riled me up even more. Is anybody else mad? You know, because pain and, and sadness uh, move into anger. Sometimes I call it righteous indignation, and, and I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but, I, but I've heard people, and you go back and forth, and people say, well, now's not the time to talk about this, or now's not the time to talk about security, or this, or that. I mean, it's always the time to talk about these things. And the reality is, I guess why it sticks in my craw is because this is just a reminder to me that there's no safe place for my kids, this happens in schools, in nurseries, in churches, in malls, in theaters. This kind of stuff happens everywhere, and not just in this country, but it's happening here with increasing frequency. And, and, and I struggle because I want to just say, you know, well, it's society, it's just getting worse, and we've just got to do a better job in the church. But the reality is, friends, it's been like this for thousands of years. There have always been people that would seek to take the lives of innocent people. Now, here's the deal, and this is the struggle part, because we will begin conversations. Some of you that are in healthcare professions, you can really appreciate this, because there's a, a real element to this in all of this tragedy. We'll, we'll learn more about this young man, and, and perhaps there'll be a diagnosis of some sort of mental illness or something that's happened. It'll be real easy for somebody to, to point the finger and say, oh, it's this, it's that, it's their fault. But friends, here's the problem. We're essentially powerless. I, I don't say that to, to try to make you feel horrible and, and scared, we're, but we're powerless. If anybody wants to do something to harm others, they have the free will to do it. And that's difficult for us to understand. Because we read a story about a child that is born. And about a horrific king who would seek to take the life of that child. And there's an angel that appears and warns the family and warns Joseph to escape, to run away, to take his family to Egypt. And then we hear the scripture reference that Jim shared with us during the prayer that King Herod ordered that all the infant children in Bethlehem and the surrounding area under the ages of two be killed. And that a voice was heard throughout the region wailing a loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. It was hard to watch our president wipe away tears. Leaders, governors, congressmen and women wipe away tears as they try to talk about the innocence that was stolen and lost. And the adults 
that loved these kids and worked with these kids that lost their lives as well. Our hearts cry out, and it spurred conversation even here at the church. I don't know if you're aware of this, but we are always talking about safety concerns here at the church. We always have. It's always been important to us. Some of you know that you may notice when you come and go from church on Sundays, you notice the two off-duty sheriffs that we have that help with the getting on and off 377. Well, during the services, they come down to the building. They stay on campus the whole morning. Now, we originally hired the security officers. Many of you don't know this, but we were concerned. We have a, a handful of slow-driving grandmas in our church. I don't know if you've noticed. Just a handful. Not to be stereotypical here this morning, but a few slow-moving grandmas. All right? You don't want to be in a hurry when you get behind them. And listen, we're now, we're on 377. You know what the speed limit is out in front of our church? 60, which means they drive what in Texas? About 70. Right? And we didn't want grandma not getting run over by a reindeer, getting run by a Ford Explorer, all right? We didn't want that happening to grandma. And so we originally hired the sheriffs to get that traffic slowed down. And when the people are coming and going from the campus, sometimes close to 700 people on a Sunday morning, that we wanted to get them on and off that highway, if you will, um, in safety. But you know why else they're there? In my mind, they're a deterrent. They're a deterrent from somebody who's just driving down the road one day and they're frustrated, they're angry or whatever, and they want to make an example of somebody, right? And so they're a deterrent. But here's the problem, friends. We can't guarantee anything, can we? I mean, we could, we could have sheriffs here every day and there's no guarantee um, we are building this new building, and one of the things you might not be aware of, but we're going to build a new um, children's and youth wing. And as part of that building, we are going to refit all the security features of this building and go to a keyless entry system for all the children's areas. All right? That's something we've been wanting to do for a while, but we were going to wait and do it this year when we integrated the whole system because we knew it would be harder to start that and then try to integrate it the other way. But here's the reality, friends. Even that won't deter everyone. And so here's the question we have to ask. While we wait, okay, while we wait, what are we as a people of faith going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? We have men and women in our church in law enforcement and protective details. and They see security risks at the highest, most classified levels. And they will tell you there is no guarantee of knowing where a danger will come from. But while they wait, they wait in vigilance. Now I want to talk about that from a spiritual perspective this morning. How do we wait productively as a church because when we talk about advent and the coming of christ what it calls our attention to and i don't know if you think about this but the advent of christ also calls our attention to another coming and that is the second coming for we believe christ has already come and what advent is is a celebration of that first coming but as a people of faith we believe that god's kingdom is still progressing toward the ultimate end when goodness, which is stronger than evil, will overcome and light will defeat darkness and a calf will lie down with a wolf and a lion will lie down with a lamb and a child will lead them all. That's what we wait for. And those images are essentially we're waiting for true peace where no one is harmed, where no one lashes out, where evil visits doorsteps no more. That's what we're waiting for. And so what do we do in the time that we wait? I think we choose, while we wait, to be productive. And I think it's important for us this morning, although we won't go into the fullness of the sermon as I had originally prepared and talking about mentors, I still think it's important for us to hear the conversation between Mary and Elizabeth because I think it's appropriate 
and it's timely because here we have two women who were waiting and who didn't recognize the fullness of what they were waiting for yet, but both women had sons who ended up having their lives taken from them by those who would bring evil to their doorsteps. These women, though we don't see them in this role now, are not too different from any of those mothers or fathers in Connecticut right now who are weeping over the loss of their children. And so I think it's important for us to hear their conversation. And if you've got your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke, the first chapter, and this is Mary's visit to Elizabeth. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed in a loud cry, Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, it wasn't for Mary to come and to brag about her pregnancy. Mary came to a visit to visit Elizabeth because most likely she was coming to help Elizabeth with her pregnancy. She would have known that her relative was pregnant. Most scholars believe that Elizabeth, because of what the scriptures tell us, was quite a bit older than Mary. And most likely, if not an older cousin, may have very well been her aunt or even a great aunt. And so Mary goes to Elizabeth to share in Elizabeth's pregnancy. But when Mary arrives, does Elizabeth say, hey, look at me, do you like my ensemble? I actually found something that fits me here in my later stages of pregnancy. What do you think, Mary? Now, what does Elizabeth say when Mary arrives? Oh, that I could be so blessed that the mother of my Lord comes to visit me. What humility we see in Elizabeth. What an incredible mentor Elizabeth must have been for Mary. Because Mary, we know, we don't have the conversation here in Scripture, but we know Mary was most likely coming to Elizabeth's to seek counsel from her mentor, to say, you're not going to believe what's happened. I need you to help me figure out how we're going to tell the family. Friends, I I don't know if you feel this way this morning, but I felt this way. I've scrambled. I've talked to so many of my mentors and, and wondered, okay, how are we going to deal with this as a church? One of the things I noticed when I was going through the the distribution list of the clergy that are in the network that I correspond with, one of the things that struck me is as I was going through it, one of the pastors that lives about 20 miles from the town there in Newtown, Sandy Hook, Connecticut, he said, all of the pastors appreciate the prayers and what you're going to do with your sermons, but as you prepare for your sermons on Sunday and to talk to your congregations, would you remember Pastor Mel Kawakami, who pastors the church there, Newtown United Methodist Church there in Sandy Hook. Would you remember him? And we know one of the things I noticed in all the correspondence, there wasn't a single posting from Mel, who pastors in the town. You know why? He's too busy for Facebook this week. He's trying to figure out how he's going to bury a bunch of kids in one week. And working with the other pastors in that community and how they're going to do it. And I got to tell you, when we start to think about that, we start to wonder, what can we do? And, and I believe this. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but this is a reminder, and we need to remember this each and every day. 
we have a responsibility as a church, as a community, as a collection of grandparents, parents, aunts, and uncles. I don't know if you took your covenant seriously, but when I baptized this child over here, I asked every one of you, would you do everything in your power? I didn't say, would you do it when it's convenient for you? Or, hey, if you have a little extra time, would you help them out? I said, would you do everything in your power to support this family as long as they're in this community and they're raising little Harper Grace in this church? Would you do everything in your power to make sure that she is surrounded in love so that one day she'll see such a beautiful image of who God is that she's going to claim Christ for her own. That someday, maybe at 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, somewhere along the way, she's going to claim Christ as her own. Friends, we have a window, and it's an ever-shrinking window, from the ages of about 7 to 14, where if we don't reach the hearts of these children, something else will. Friends, we have not just an opportunity, we have a responsibility to invest in the lives of the kids. And I share this with you in closing, that I have decided that I wasn't just going to get angry about this, but that I'm going to do something about it. And I wish I could say that I would have going to do something on Wednesday or Thursday or even Friday morning when I got up. But I've decided that I'm already invested in some ways with my own kids but I'm going to find ways to invest even more so in the kids. I don't know if you guys know this, um, but I'm not a very good senior pastor. But I was a really good youth director. I really was. And you know what I've decided I'm going to do? I'm going to spend more time even with our own youth group here. We've got a youth director, and, and he's going to do his job. But I'm going to spend even more time. I like to go on some of the trips with them, but I'm going to find ways where I can mentor some of them. Because I think I can make a difference in some of the lives of these kids. All right? And I volunteer for vacation Bible school. And sometimes I'm the voice of God. And sometimes I'm Peter. You know, and, and sometimes I'm the crazy guy that does the prayers up here. But, you know, I've decided I'm going to find some ways to invest in those kids' lives. And make a difference. That I'm going to be productive while I'm waiting for the light to be fully revealed in this world. And what I'm going to do along the way is I'm going to try to be the salt and the light that Jesus commanded me to be. And I want to ask you to join me in the covenant. I want to just say this. We can't guarantee the safety of our kids, but you know what we can do? We can go after their hearts with the love of Jesus Christ. And when we see kids that are struggling, rather than turning our heads or trying to put those with mental illness over in some camp and, and label them or whatever, that we're going to start getting more engaged with people that need help and families that need help. And be more at the front lines of the eight, with the eight, along partnering with the agencies that are really doing that hard work. Does that make sense, guys? That we're not going to be that church that talks about it just on Sunday, but we're going to put our money where our mouth is in those ministries. And I'm going to do something a little different this Christmas, too. Last Christmas, I got into this idea of Advent conspiracy and that I'd spend a little less on myself and a little less on my own kids. They didn't like that idea but that I'd spend a little more putting that money into ministries that I feel are really, really important. And so you know what I'm going to do? I'm making a donation to Newtown United Methodist Church. And anybody else that wants to do it, anybody else that wants to put on their check, you can take, I don't care, you can take the whole check you were going to give to us that month. Put Newtown on it. I'll get it all to them. I don't care. That's how blessed we are as a church. If you want to do it, send it. If you want to get involved with Children's Advocacy of Denton County, I personally know the director. If you want to get involved with Health Services in North Texas, director's a member of our church. Well, not for long. He's going to retire. But we know the new director coming, and we know the current director, and I know half the board will get you involved in that ministry, hands-on ministry that helps families and helps kids and is making a difference in the lives of others. I want to invite you, and as us as a church, to let the light of Christ shine through us in such a way 
that we might be the salt and light in the world and that the darkness would not overcome it. Amen? Would you join me? And let's make a difference and let anger and, res and, and turn into righteous indignation. Does that make sense? Righteous indignation is much more productive than anger. And resolve. Spiritual faith, resolve, and trust in Christ is even more effective than that. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, this, is, this has been a tough one. But I am reminded of the words of one of the fathers, Robbie Parker, who lost his three-year-old, Emily. He was asked how he's dealing with this, and he acknowledged that the person who perpetrated these acts did this on his own free will. And that as much as he wished it wouldn't have happened, God did not violate that young man's free will, and that that person took a very bad turn and path. So many lives were lost as a result and changed forever. But this grieving father said that he would use his free will to be an agent of grace and hope, loving his wife and his other children in such a way that he would continue the legacy of his lost child and in the midst of his own healing and grappling with how and why this could happen, he would offer love and support to all the other families who'd lost a child or a loved one. And that he would even offer love and support to the family of the shooter. Lord, I think most of us would confess we don't even know if we could do that last part. I know this, we can't do it without your light shining in us. So Lord, I pray that as we wait, we might be productive. And that we might make a difference in the lives of the young people in our community. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.